What's up everyone and welcome back to the comms channel and the start of a new Mesh-tastic series where we'll cover some of the more advanced uses of Mesh-tastic. The previous Getting Started series was to get you up and running with a basic setup with a few nodes. In this advanced series we'll be getting into some of the more advanced topics and deployments and for today's video we'll be taking a deep dive into the radio configuration options so you can configure your Mesh-tastic setup to get the most out of it based on your needs. So please join me as we dig into the Mesh-tastic radio configuration. We're approaching a restricted area. Restricted area is one mile west. Before we get into it, I just want to give a quick shout out to the channel's recent supporters. Your support is very much appreciated, and if you're finding these videos useful and would like to support the channel as well, you can do so by using the coffee link in the video description or by using the thanks button below the video. Thank you for your support and helping with the channel's continued production. Meshtastic has a wide variety of different radio configuration options, and that's what we're going to go over today. As mentioned in the intro, we'll be taking a deep dive into these, and this will probably be a multi-part video. To get to these settings, tap on the three dot menu on the top right and then select radio configuration. So the first one we have is the user section and this is where you would name your device with a long name and a short name. On the user config page we have node ID. This is unique to your device and derived from the device's MAC address. This option can't be changed and is just informational. Next there's the long name. You can set this to whatever you like up to 39 characters. You can even use emojis on the long name if you like. Then you can also enter in something for the short name but this has to be four characters or less. And if we look at the node list screen we can see how this is implemented with the short name in the bubble and the long name beside it. So back to the user config page, you'll see that there's another informational section showing the hardware model that can't be changed. And below that you'll see a toggle switch for licensed amateur radio. If you're planning on using Meshtastic for amateur radio use, you can turn this on. But just know that since encryption is against FCC regulations, turning this on will disable encryption. The next radio configuration page we'll look at is channels. Now this is not to be confused with channels as in frequencies, which we'll get into when we cover the lore settings. Channels in this sense, it's best to think of them as chat rooms. Or if you remember IRC back in the day, you would have different IRC channels, which were essentially different IRC chat rooms. So when you think of them as chat rooms, it'll make more sense. So this channel configuration page is for configuring these different chat rooms, the encryption for them, and the enabling or disabling of messaging using internet gateways. You can have a total of eight channels and they're numbered zero through seven. And you can see here we have the default long fast primary channel. This channel is what will be on the device in the default configuration. And while it is encrypted, it uses a default encryption key and other people that are also on the default configuration will be able to join your mesh. And some people may want to stay on the default and just see who else is out there. And then other people, they may want their own private encryption for themselves. And we'll get into all of that later. And you'll also see we have an admin channel here. This admin channel isn't here by default. This is something I added for the ability to manage remote nodes over the mesh network. And remote node management will be covered in a video later on in this series. Now there are three possible roles that a channel can have. It'll be either primary, secondary, or disabled. Some settings like the channel roles can't be configured from the phone app, but you can use the Meshtastic command line interface or the web client at client.meshtastic.org, which is very easy to use and both of these will be covered in a later video as well. You can add a new channel by hitting the plus button on the bottom right here. Then you can give the channel a, a name and you'll notice that it'll auto-generate a pre-shared key for you. You can also hit the refresh button to generate a new key as well. Next you'll see these toggle switches for uplink and downlink enabled. These are for MQTT and what MQTT does is allow you to bridge mesh-tastic networks that are too far apart to reach over the radio signals by connecting them over the internet. MQTT will also be discussed in a later video in this series. If you don't want to use MQTT, you can just leave these turned off. 
If you do want them on, enabling downlink will forward messages from MQTT to your mesh network. Enabling uplink will send messages from the mesh network to MQTT. Now once you're done, you can hit save to finish configuring a new channel. The next configuration page is the device configuration, and this is where the role of your device can be set. Meshtastic will mesh with other devices out of the box, but you can use these roles to change the behavior of a device to better suit your needs with the following options. First one is going to be client, and by default, all devices using Meshtastic will mesh together using this client role and can operate using the Meshtastic apps like the Android app, the iOS app, and the web client over either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Next option we have is client mute. And this role is like the regular client role, but this one won't forward packets from other systems. Some use cases for this role would be perhaps you have a node on a tower on your property or some high point on your property that's just too far to reach via Bluetooth from the inside of your house. You could have another node indoors that you would connect to via Bluetooth that'll communicate with your outdoor node and then from there to the rest of the mesh network. This client mute role would be a good choice for your indoor node since the outdoor node is a better choice for contributing to the mesh network. There would be no need for your indoor node to rebroadcast traffic. And I see this as being useful to create a less noisy RF environment, especially if you have a high number of nodes. Next we have router, and the router mode is a good choice for devices that will be located at a high elevation or whatever location that will have the best coverage and reach the most devices. Devices with this role will take a higher priority in handling packets, so packets will prefer to go through devices that have this role. One thing to note is this role will use more battery power due to the increased transmissions from the increased traffic being routed through the node. However, this role puts the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radios and screen to sleep to conserve battery. Next up, we have router client. And this role is similar to the router role we just talked about, but the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth radios, and screens will not be shut off. So you can still use your node as a client if you wish. Next up, we have repeater. And like the router roles, devices with this role will take a higher priority and mesh packets will prefer to go through these devices. What makes repeater different from router is this role won't transmit unnecessary packets like node info or device telemetry. And this means this device won't show up in the list of nodes and you won't be able to send direct messages to it or view the current battery percentage or any telemetry or sensor info. The repeater mode has some additional configuration and that's this section for rebroadcast mode. So the all setting is the default, and this default setting is probably fine for most people, and it'll rebroadcast all messages from your own mesh network, as well as the mesh network of others, even if they're not using the same encryption keys. Next option is all, skip decoding. And this is similar to the all setting, but this just rebroadcasts and does no decoding of the packets. Then there's local only, and this will not rebroadcast traffic unless the traffic is using your encryption key. Now the last setting is known only, and this isn't showing up on my version of the Android app at the moment, but it'll likely show up soon, and this is an upcoming option. And this known only option is similar to local only, but this will also not rebroadcast traffic unless the node is in the device's node database. So heading back to the device role list, next we'll have the tracker role. And this is useful for devices whose main purpose is GPS tracking. It has a power saving option that saves the battery by putting the device to sleep until it's ready to provide a position update and then it'll go back to sleep. Going down the list here, we have the sensor role, which is ideal for devices that's main goal is to just provide sensor telemetry. And these telemetry packets will be a higher priority and broadcast every five minutes. And similar to the tracker role, this also has a power saving option that'll put the device to sleep until it's ready to transmit the sensor telemetry. 
Next, we have the attack roll, which is used for devices that will be used with the Meshtastic attack plugin, for those of you familiar with ATAC. For those of you unaware of ATAC, this stands for the Android Team Awareness Kit, and it's a Blue Team Situational Awareness app originally used by the U.S. military and later made publicly available for public safety and civilian use. Now there's two new roles that don't show up in the app yet, but they can be configured from the web client. The first one is client hidden, and this one will turn off the routine broadcast and only transmit when necessary, like when sending messages back and forth. This role could be potentially useful for making radio direction finding of your device more difficult or to conserve battery power. Then we finally have the lost and found role, which this could have some use cases like a beacon someone could use if they need help or for tracking a pet or you can also locate your own device by remotely turning on this role using the admin channel and more on that in a later video. Then we have a few toggle switches for disabling or enabling serial output and the debug log. And then below that we have redefine pin button and redefine pin buzzer. These are to define the GPIO pin numbers if your device doesn't have a predefined buzzer or a user button and you add one later on. Then we have the node info broadcast interval which sets how often your device broadcasts information about itself. Then below that we have three toggle switches. First one is double tap as a button press and this is used for devices with an accelerometer that detects when you double tap and it'll act as a button press. Next, there's the managed mode switch, and when this is on, it'll prevent changing of the radio configurations via client application and makes these configurations only accessible through the remote node administration through the admin channel. The final toggle switch is the disable triple click. Devices like the T-Beam and its centermost button can be used to quickly turn off the GPS by triple clicking on it. And if you don't want this feature, you can disable it by turning on this toggle switch. I like to try to keep my videos around 10 minutes long if possible, so that'll do it for part one of this deep dive into the Meshtastic radio configuration options, and I hope you found it useful. If you did, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and then subscribe if you haven't already done so, and, and join me when we go into part two of this video where we'll go into the rest of the radio configuration options. Thank you all and have a good one.